Okay, today is um, Sunday, August 25th, 2013. I was just wondering, uh, the fact that we have two time clocks and uh, there's no time card or anything on the second time clock and, uh, and we're already on duty when we come to work, like I said before, me and 400 other truck drivers, we're already on duty when we come to work. Okay, according to the Department of Transportation Regulation and Company Policy and Union Contract, you will follow the Department of Transportation. Now we have to uh, clock in and out of that time clock and there's no time card. And the uh, uh, automatic recording device or the uh, recorder in the tractor is tamper-proof. Tamper-proof. There's no way you can alter or change anything on that log. The driver can't do that. He can't do anything. It's automated. Okay, so you can't falsify anything on that tractor, no matter what. You can come in at 10, 11, 12 o'clock. It doesn't matter. It's going to start at 1030. And I don't understand uh, what this is really all about. I, I can't figure it out. I don't have anything in writing um, explaining to me what why I deserve any type of disciplinary action whatsoever uh, because of that second time clock that has no time card. It doesn't record anything. It doesn't do anything. Okay, and uh, as we all know, like I said before, uh, the trip sheet, uh, they only pay you by the miles. It doesn't record anything from the uh, second time clock. So there's no way of knowing that you ever got paid or how much time you put in um, other than the fact that it's going to be a mismatch on the trip sheet. Because when you log out of that tractor, you're off duty leaving Tracy, but it's a lie. It's not true. You're not leaving, Tracy, because you're still on duty because you're instructed to clock out of the second time clock uh, in the driver's room. Now, that being said, uh, I don't know what to think. I don't even know what's going on. I mean, they didn't give me nothing in writing. I, they explained to me why this or why that. I just follow instructions. Just like 400 other teamsters and truck drivers there. We just do what we're told, told to do, and we do it. Uh, for them to take the time off the second time clock and alter or falsify my logs and then not make me aware of the fact that that's what they did and write it down in the remarks section is wrong. Okay? It's completely wrong. It's not right. Uh, and I think they're just doing this because I have a disability. They didn't follow the time limits. Um, they didn't notify me within 10 days, and I should have been put back to work by 1,500 other Teamsters. You know, and I, you know, I don't know. I called Mike Sadler on the 10th day. I called him. I called him on the 16th. I have telephone records to establish the fact that I called Nightwalker on the 16th. And my wife was here, and there was other people here, you know, because I want to verify the fact. I want to know what's going on. So I can get back to work. But uh, Nightwanger said he hasn't heard anything on the 16th. That's when Mike Sadler made out the, uh, the uh, agreements. On the 16th, that's the 10th day. It's got to be within 10 days. The union didn't receive it until the 17th of December 2010. That's 11 days. I should have been put back to work like 1,500 other teamsters, but they didn't put me to work, and they didn't explain anything. They didn't give me anything in writing, you know, and I've been trying to tell them for the last three years that uh, they didn't they didn't file a grievance within 10 days. You know, I, I go in around and around, and, and, and just, I, it, just, it just boggles the mind what the heck's going on. You know, so uh, I have to uh, get this notation down correctly. I'm going to try for court. I go to uh, trial because I, I I need somebody to explain it to me. Maybe they have to explain it to me in trial. If that's what needs to be done, well, then it needs to be done. But I got to tell you, they I got the document to show that they union received its stamp received the 17th of December 
2010. That's 11 days from the date of incident. And the incident is December 6, 2010. Now from December 6, 2010 to the 17th of April, 2010 is 11 days. They didn't file a grievance within 10 days. And they didn't uh, file within 10 days uh, like uh, they were required to do to provide documents, evidence, photos, etc. by the 26th of December, 2010. So they violated uh, step one and step two of the contract, uh, you know? So uh, article 25 and 26 is what it is. So, uh, and all articles of the contract, they violated everything. But the point is uh, that second time clock doesn't do anything. And I don't even know what that's about, really. I can assume anything. I can assume that he's saying that I punched it late. I can assume that... Uh, uh, I was drunk. I can assume anything, but I didn't. I'm not going to because it's ridiculous. There's no time card. And me and 400 other drivers, uh, we just do what we're told to do. And now he wants to do, uh, uh, use it for whatever, uh, uh, for whatever. I don't know. See, I'm stumbling at work because I don't know what he wants, what he's doing. He didn't explain it to me. He didn't put it down. No representation, no nothing. I don't know what the hell is going on. And uh, Jesus Christ, man, somebody ought to do something. I mean, uh, the, they ought to get testimony from the drivers. If it's not within 10 days, the driver's put back to work immediately. There's no doubt about it. That's the contract. So they didn't follow the contract. The second uh, time clock, there's no time card. And the drivers and myself, for 400 plus drivers, and myself haven't been paid in, I haven't been paid in the last 10 years by that time clock, and we should be getting paid by the hour for services rendered. But we didn't get paid. We haven't been paid. Now, uh, we follow the union contract. We follow company policy. I do what I'm told to do. We have a no fault attendant policy that's been there for I don't know how long, and uh, I don't get it. I don't get it. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm not going to contact Mr. Nicewanger because I, because I, my attorney sent me to report to work because um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. M-O-R-L-E-S of uh, Safeway Private Insurance in Arizona sent a letter to my attorney to report to work. So I report to work. And Mike Sadler does, says, I don't know anything about it. And the union doesn't do anything. Mike Sadler, I mean, Mr. Nightwanger says he do not know anything about it. And I don't really recall if, if he said he was going to look into it or do this or do that. But I haven't heard anything. I'm still sitting here. So, uh, and I, you know, I, I don't understand why Mr. Nightwanger didn't say something when I called him on the 10th day. He should have had me put back to work. Uh, why he didn't put me back to work is, uh, is uh, the judge is going to have to have to ask the question. Why didn't Mr. Nightwanger put me back to work on the 10th day when I call? And I guess I'll have to produce the telephone records. But, uh, you know, I, I just don't know what's going on. So uh, that's why I'm making this notation is the fact that uh, I called Mr. Nightwanger on the 10th day. I have telephone records to establish that fact and witnesses and the fact that he didn't put me back to work or the company refused to put me back to work, one or the other. And the second time clock, uh, those issues haven't been resolved by the union and they laid it on workman's comp to resolve those issues. Uh, uh, disability issues, I suppose. I guess they're not, they might not deal with the second time clock. I don't know what, what authority they have. Maybe they don't have any authority at all. Maybe if they're just going to deal with disability issues. And if that's the case, they still have to put me back to work. It doesn't matter. I have a permanent disability. I have a hearing impairment. I was on FMLA. And, uh, and I wasn't fired on December 6th or December 7th. I was just flat out sent home and I worked the whole year of 2010. 
And the, uh, the QME report that goes along with the notice of offer work states I can do my customary duty. So I should be working. And I'm supposed to work first and grieve later. That didn't happen. So uh, why am I not working? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I'm stumped. I really don't know why I'm not working. And there's no disciplinary matter at all. All issues are dropped because they didn't reply within 10 days. So there's no issues other than I have a disability. So it's obvious they're not putting me back to work because I have a disability. And that's the bottom line of this notation for court. The reason they're not putting me back to work is because I have a disability. And so uh, I guess I'll have to wait till I go to trial and let the court uh, make their decision. But the fact is, beyond a reasonable doubt, they didn't file a grievance within 10 days. Beyond a reasonable doubt, I called on the 10th day to Mr. Nyswanger, and he said he hasn't had anything or he didn't hear anything. Okay, uh, that's fact two. Fact three is that they didn't receive the grievance until uh, December 17, 2010. And the incident was December 6, 2010, and that's the date that the dispatcher took the time from the second time clock and, and altered my time on my logs. And as I said before, I went to the Highway Patrol Office, Department of Transportation, and they said that it appears that my logs were tampered or altered with. So uh, we don't need to go into that. Uh, according to 395.5, 395.16, and 395.8, uh, according to that regulation, the dispatcher is the only one to hit the key, and he took that special privilege and he falsified my logs. Now, um, I don't know what more I can say to the fact that I need to be returned to work, and the notice of offer work used to be enforced for one year, and that uh, <clears throat> I should get all back paid from December 7, 2010. And uh, what about uh, from 2002? I don't know because there's no time card for December 7, 2010. So the question arises, are, is he, am I going to get paid from 2002 or December 7, 2010? So I don't know how they're going to deal with that question or how they're going to act on it if they do at all. I know that they should pay me from December 7, 2010, but there's no time card. There's no trip sheet. I didn't see anything. I didn't get anything. I got nothing in writing. So I should get all back pay and, and, and benefits and everything from uh, 2000, uh, from uh, 2002 or from December 7, 2010. So that's where the judge will decide. Now, um, I guess that's going to be my statement for the court. I don't know what else to do. I'm sitting here waiting for a telephone call or registered mail to report to work. And it hasn't happened. And I've been off work for three years, and I haven't, and I haven't had a paycheck in three years. I have not had a paycheck in three years, and I'm not on disability. I am not on disability. So, uh, and so, uh, an insurance company hasn't sent me any money, and I don't know why they should, because I'm not on disability. But then again, I don't know workman comp rules and regulations. But before they sent me home, December on December 7, 2010, I was collecting unemployment, and the uh, unemployment office <clears throat> said they were in conflict of liability. And then I had to file when they sent me home on December 7, 2010, and the unemployment office says, states that they were in conflict of liability again, that I should be working. There's no doubt about it, I should be working. That's the state's position with the unemployment office. So, uh, Christ, I don't know. I'm going on three years here, and uh, and I need my lifetime medical insurance. So uh, I need to go back to work in order, order to obtain my lifetime medical that I paid for in 2002. So uh, I don't know what's going on. I have nothing in writing, nothing. 
is bog-mining. When I go to the psychiatrist, I'm going to present him with the documents showing that they did not file a grievance within 10 days. I'm going to give that to the psychiatrist. I'm also going to give the letter that I would send to the attorney to me, and I don't know to my attorney or not, the letter that's stating that I was fired on December 16, 2010. I don't know how that could be if the grievance was fa was uh, made out on December 16, 2010. Uh, and that was the 10th day. That was the 10th day. They should have put me back to work. It says within 10 days. That's not within 10 days. So the attorney sends me a letter saying I'm fired on December 16, 2010. Mike Sadler makes a, a grievance out on December 16, 2010. The same day the attorney said I was fired and the grievance was received by local 439 on December 17, 2010. That's 11 days. It's not within 10 days. Now, I th I'm assuming that the, uh, that the union attorney made a mistake. But uh, that's not for me to say. And... Uh, so I guess I'll have to leave this up to the judge to decide uh, what's going on here because it's confusing and they're not following the contract or contractual procedures. And uh, Mr. Nightwonger should have sent them a letter for me to return to work when I talked to him on December 10, 2010. And he didn't do so because I'm not working. I'm sitting here and I don't know why. So... Uh, if Nightwonger is going to take any action uh, about that and the fact that uh, they didn't finish the panel hearing and uh, due to the fact that uh, I have a severe profound hearing impairment and they didn't accommodate me. And uh, I mentioned to him when I was there with the, with a letter from the attorney to report to work, the fact that I have a legal document. So uh, I'm not clear about that, but I, I'm assuming that that's what I told him. But in any event, uh, I had a letter from the attorney to report to work. He should have looked into it. He should have called my attorney and find out the uh, what's going on. If I have a legal to have a legal document that I'm deaf and this and that, he should have talked to my uh, attorney, Modesto Legal Clinic. But I don't know if he did or he didn't. And in any event, it's not within 10 days. And I should be returned to work like 1,500 Teamsters. And it wasn't done. And the second time clock is tamper-proof. You need a key in order to change anything on them logs. So the, and the driver and the uh, dispatcher didn't make me aware of anything on December 7, 2010. So that has got nothing to do with my disability. It's just the fact that uh, if he tries to say something, I don't know what he's talking about. He can tuck his head off all he wants like he did on December 7, 2010. Um, he was ecstatic. That guy was just, I don't know. I don't know what I walked into. I have no idea what this guy is yelling about, okay? There's no time card on that second time clock. And on the trip sheet, it only pay you with trip miles, and there's a mismatch. If you look at the trip sheet, you'll see where the driver, driver logged out, and then there should be a second time on, but on the bottom of that time, indicating when the guy clocked out of that driver's room in the, uh, in the driver's room he clocked out. Now, he should be getting paid by the hour. He should be getting paid by the hour because he's not getting paid by the trip sheet because they only pay by the mile. So the difference between the time the uh, driver logged out of that truck and the time that's uh, written in or printed in underneath it when he clocked out of that driver's room should be paid by the hour because there's no proof that he ever got paid because the, the uh, logs are not recording anything. They're not recording nothing when he logged out of that truck. It says leaving Tracy. It's a lie. The driver's not leaving Tracy. It's a violation of the Department of Transportation Regulation. And I don't know why nobody's looking at it. Uh, Mr. Nightswanger should check it out. Uh, but uh, the work with comp don't handle union issues. They only work with disability issues. And I have an issue with disability, and the union admits that. 
So they laid it on workman's comp to put me back to work. And I hope work for his comp puts me back to work because they buy it. We have a contractual agreement that if it's not within 10 days, I'm, I'm to be put back to work like 1,500 other teamsters. And uh, the workman comp judge should follow the contractual procedures and put me back to work. And then the hearing impairment violation of 132A, uh, I don't know what he wants to do about that. But I'm asking the judge to put me back to work because I was on FMLA, they violated the 10, 10, uh, 10 day uh, time limit. Uh, they didn't produce anything on the December 25th or 26th, 2010, evidence, photos, or documents stating what my disciplinary matter is or should be or was. Uh, so it's null and void, final and binding. All issues are dropped. There are no issues other than the disability and the fact that they didn't follow contractual procedure. They didn't file agreements within 10 days. So that's my notation uh, for trial. And uh, I'm gonna, I, and also uh, I invoke uh, double standards. I invoke uh, uh, double standards. Life is not fair. And I'm asking that the court to take that into consideration and return me to work according to the contract and according to workman's comp rules and regulations. Uh, that's my statement for trial. I'd like to know one thing. I'd like to make a correction on that last recording. Uh, instead of trip sheet, it should say logs. Logs. When you everything had to be recorded, you get paid by the logs. You only get paid trip miles. Now, when you log out of that truck, it says leaving Tracy. On the left side of that log down below, there'll be a different time. Uh, time the time will be from the uh, time clock in the driver's room. There's a mismatch. That time when it says leaving Tracy to the time that you log out of that driver's room should be paid by the hour. Should be paid by the hour, and there's no time card. You should get uh, paid for services rendered, and it's not being done. So uh, I like to make that correction. And, and two... It's like I said, it was a time limits. They violated time limits that should have been returned to work. Uh, and that's the bottom line. All issues are dropped. I should be working no matter what. The State Department of the Unemployment Office, uh, they said they're in conflict of liability. I should also be working. And also, when Mr. Nicewanger sent the letter on December 17, 2010, to James Williams, the transportation manager, to uh, put me back to work immediately, immediately, and he didn't do so. Uh, I'm going to give a copy of that to the psychiatrist to back up what I'm saying. Okay, so I should be working all this time because they're in contractual violation and they uh, uh, didn't put me back to work at least three or four times when they were told to do so, including administrative judge while Judge Grill was off sick. So uh, why I'm sitting here waiting for a phone call and registered mail, I have no idea. This is mind boggling. I don't know what's going on. So uh, when I get to the psychiatrist, I'll produce all documents. And uh, like I said before, I, Julio Zamora, invoke double standards. Life is not fair. Okay, I'm just gonna add this to the end of that recording. Um, I'd like to uh, remind the court the fact that the uh, when I was sent home on December 7, 2010, uh, uh, when I received the QME report on December 1, 2010, it wasn't complete. The QME report was not complete because the, uh, the doctor, uh, I forgot his name, um, said that uh, he doesn't do hearing tests. And uh, I received that on December 1st, 2010, like I said, a uh, uh, short story. I don't want to make a long story out of a short story. The fact is that uh, the uh, QME report wasn't complete. They offered me work for one year, and I needed it enforced. Because the uh, QME re uh, report wasn't finished yet. They just flat out sent me home. And I'm sitting here, and, and I don't know why I'm sitting here. They violated all the time limits. 
They didn't produce any evidence of, of what, to, uh, what my disciplinary action is to be or what it was by December 25th. And then, and uh, at least they had to put something in by December 28th, within 10 days. They didn't do so. They didn't do anything. They went around the Board of Adjustments. Uh, and that has time limits within 30 days. They didn't do that. They didn't. They just didn't do anything within the time limits. And I don't know why I'm sitting here waiting for a phone call or register mail to report to work when I have 200 employees underneath me. Now, James Williams, the transportation manager in Tracy, California, knows all this. He should have returned me to work like he does for 1,500 other Dreamsters. On 400 truck drivers, if it's not within the time limits, they're returned to work immediately. If it's not within the time limits, they're returned to work immediately. Now, I should note for uh, for the record, and, and uh, an administrative judge Bill, the fact that uh, I don't know why I'm sitting here. They didn't produce anything. I never received any registered mail whatsoever of any suspension or discharge within the time limits. I did not receive one document of why I'm sitting here waiting for a phone call or registered mail to report to work according to the notice of offer of work that I asked for Eureka Run at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I'm still sitting here waiting. So I should get all that back pay because they didn't comply. Three times they didn't comply, and I hate to keep repeating myself, but this my life is on the line here, and I don't know why I'm sitting here. I don't have one document, not one document for suspension or discharge, or the reason why I'm sitting here by registered mail within the time limits, not one, and I'm still sitting here. So I should get all that back pay and benefits, and I hope Judge. Uh, uh, Administrative Judge uh, Grill uh, returns me work according to the no notice of offer of work that wasn't complete. They just flat out sent me home. And so I'm not going to go into it anymore about the deposition that I, get, I wasn't accommodated or anything else. And I need to take another deposition for the record. And that uh, I have a new attorney, Modesto um, Legal Clinic, who took my case. Um, obviously, uh, by my statement, you know why, uh, the fact that Judge Bill didn't have nothing on the table, not my severe profound hearing impairment or the notice of offer of work. And that, um, um, if it's at all possible, if Judge Bill could agree to the fact that Safeway should pay all attorney fees and expenses to Modesto Legal Clinic for all their hard work and getting me to be returned to work. For the fact that um, Adam Stewart, um, I feel that he failed in his responsibility by not giving me a hearing test or uh, not mentioning the fact to the administrative judge bill that the um, QME report was not complete and uh, I didn't get paid every week or every two weeks and that uh, they're in conflict of liability with the EDD, Department of, uh, of Unemployment. And he didn't mention one word about it since 4-17-2009 and ongoing. And I received another document from EDD saying that safely is in conflict of liability. I should be working. So uh, with that being said, and the fact that uh, Safeway doesn't want to comply and uh, it's just more time and money for uh, for Modesto Legal Clinic, who's representing me. And I don't feel I should have to pay Adam Stewart anything. So, uh, but that's for, uh, for you to decide what is fair and equal under the law. And your decision, uh, I, I agree to accept your decision, whatever is reasonable under the law. But I do, I do request to go to trial. Uh, to hear the case uh, for the two, two Disability Act of 2009. Um, so um, anyway, like I said, I have the 
I have permission, or I was instructed to pursue this uh, by the union attorney on workman's comp, and they're aware that I have a, a disability issues. I exhausted the union remedy. There is no remedy under the union to return me to work because I have a disability. And so they're not going to deal with it, and they threw it on workman's comp's lap. So, uh, and the fact that uh, I told them that I had a severe profound hearing impairment, and that wasn't acceptable, even though I sent them a prescription, and the test results to the union attorney, and it wasn't accepted, and they denied me arbitration. And so I, Julia Zamora, invoke double standards. Life is not fair. Okay, today is uh, <clears throat> Friday, March 1st. Uh, making a, a statement for Judge Grill Settlement Conference in Stockton, California. Um, <clears throat> on 321-2009, I was injured on the job and I went to see uh, Nancy Fragio. Uh, and she stated that it was a sprain. Uh, I don't recall going to the hospital or an MRI being taken at that time. Uh, and uh, she's an alcohol and drug technician, uh, which gives you tests to see if you uh, were on drugs or alcohol at the time of injury. And there was no doctor present. Uh, on uh, maybe a week or two weeks later, I ended up in the Los Angeles Memorial Hospital uh, with severe pain. It was really, really bad. I couldn't take it anymore. So I was there all night long, and they took an MRI and discovered the fact that uh, I had a pinched nerve. They took an MRI uh, the next day. I went in there for left leg pain, the same thing I'd seen Nancy Perdillo for uh, in Tracy, California, drug and all alcohol technician who said it was a spring. Now, uh, I'm not going to go into the PR2 report because it's incorrect and it wasn't completely signed properly. And uh, the fact is I had a treating physician that I signed for good for one year, uh, uh, Paralosi, chiropractor. That if I get hurt on a job, that I'm to go to the company doctor for 30 days and then uh, Mr. Uh, the chiropractor is to take over. Okay, so, uh, and the Los Angeles Memorial Hospital made out an occupational report stating the fact that I went in there for left leg pain and that uh, I have a low back, a pinched nerve. And I don't remember who I got the referral from, if it's Los Angeles Memorial Hospital, what doctor it was, or if it was Dr. Yip or Perlosi. But they uh, gave me a referral to uh, Dr. Baby. And uh, to fix the pinched nerve, it's a walk in and walk out type deal. And uh, I was denied by Safeway, and they sent the letter to the wrong person, to Dr. Hubby, asking her if it was uh, uh, job-related, the pinched nerve. And uh, they should have sent it to Nancy for deal, the drug and all alcohol technician, but they didn't do so, um, because she's the one that said it was a sprain. So, um, <clears throat> okay, I haven't been paid every week or every two weeks. Uh, uh, disability payments uh, since uh, I would say since 321 2009 or 417 2009. I had to file for unemployment and they sent me a letter stating that Safeway was in conflict of liability and they sent me another one in 2012 or 2013 that Safeway is in conflict of liability. Uh, I should note that I have a notice of offer of work that I received on uh, December 1st. December 3rd, I went to work. On December 7, 2010, they flat out sent me home. Just flat out sent me home. They, I did, had no representation. And uh, and the fact is, I was supposed to work first and be later. Uh, that didn't happen. They just flat out sent me home. And they made false accusations. Uh, and this is all job, uh, disability re related to the fact that I filed in 2009 severe and profound hearing impairment from reaper noise. Uh, I've come to find out at the settlement conference, Judge Bill's court suggested that I get a legal document for severe and profound hearing impairment and come to find out 
because I've had a hearing problem since 2006. Uh, I needed to be uh, accompanied with a listening device because I have a more than a 50% hearing loss in both ears. And I should note also for the record, since 2006, I have never been accommodated with any sort of listening device or hearing aids or anything else for that matter. It wasn't taken serious by the union or the company. But due to the fact that they had a panel hearing, they flat out sent me home when I mentioned the fact that I had a severe profound hearing impairment, and I asked the job steward, are you an authority on severe profound hearing impairment? And uh, Mr. Nicewanger, the BA from the local 439 Teamsters in Stockton, California, which is a union shop, uh, was there also, plus another stu uh, shop steward was there when I made that statement. And uh, he said he's going to look into it, and they just flat out sent me home and didn't accommodate me. And uh, I should also note the fact that uh, they didn't uh, say we didn't follow contractual procedures. I was denied to return to work because they uh, didn't comply with the time limits uh, like they do for 1,500 other teachers. I returned to work immediately uh, if they violate the time limits. They didn't do so. I should also note that uh, they're required to go to Board of Adjustments uh, uh, for all suspension and discharges within 30 days. I should note that on December 17, 2010, Mr. Nicewanger sent a letter to the terminal manager, James Williams, that all disciplinary action to be denied and to send all proof, photos, uh, evidence, whatever you have by December 25th to establish the fact beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Zamora did wrong or deserved disciplinary action uh, and to set a time and date. Well, the terminal manager, James Williams, did not comply. He set a date for January 11, 2011. I should note that's not within 30 days, uh, according to the contract. All Board of Adjustment Suspension and Discharges are to be heard within 30 days of date of incident. And uh, they didn't comply with time limits or anything else for, uh, for the record, and on top of that, I was never notified that I was ever discharged by registered mail. I was never notified that I was ever fired, discharged, or suspended by registered mail, according to time limits. Okay? <clears throat> and uh, so going from there, they didn't honor the uh, notice of offer of work. They didn't apply, even though they made an agreement with workmen to work me for one year. And it was de deemed accepted uh, whether I turned it in or not, and I had 20 days to uh, to uh, comply or think it over if I wanted to change a job or retire, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, I asked for um, uh, Eureka Run 10 o'clock in the morning bid, and that uh, I I was hired in 2002 and that I had 200 employees underneath me and there was work available. And that anybody who works underneath me, I get paid for that day. And that's a 24 hour operation, uh, 24 hours a day and there's 400 truck drivers there. And I should note that I've been waiting for a phone call or registered mail to return to work uh, in, in which they uh, are not complying with the notice of offer of work and they're not, uh, uh, completing their agreement that they made. In other words, they're, by, they're in violation of their own agreement. Uh, so I needed to be enforced by Judge Grill in the uh, in settlement conference. Uh, I'm waiting for a court date from Modesto Legal Clinic because we were waiting for a document um, to get a legal document stating that I have a severe profound hearing impairment which states that I uh, had a hearing problem since 2006 and they haven't accommodated me with any listening device or whatsoever since 2006, okay? So on December 7, 2010, they just flat out sent me home and they didn't pay me for the day. And I wasn't represented by the union on interrogation by the dispatcher. Uh, he told me the shop steward is on his way and he told me to sit down. And I was supposed to work first and grieve later, it didn't happen. And they just flat out sent me home. And, they, and the, uh, again, I hate to repeat myself, but I have a severe profound hearing impairment. 
the uh, panel hearing was put in a fist. And I told them, uh, are you an authority on severe profound hearing impairment? And they just flat out sent me home. I had a settlement conference, and Judge Bill was off that day, and Adam Stewart was my uh, attorney, workman comp attorney at the time. Uh, the administrative judge suggested that they put me back to work due to the fact that the Safeway attorney was on the phone with Safeway, and Adam Stewart approached me, and my wife was there and asked me how long I, would, I could work for. And I thought that was peculiar because I had a notice of offer of work, guaranteed or uh, work for one year. Uh, which they didn't comply to. So that was the second time. The first time they did, they violated the time limits of the contract uh, and they didn't put me back to work like they did for 1,500 other teamsters. The second time was the administrative judge suggesting that they put me to work and the Safeway attorney must have told Adam Stewart, I don't know because when he asked me how long I could work for and he left, uh, a lady or her secretary came up to us and, and uh, told us to go to the lunchroom and then later told us to go home. So that was the second time. The third time, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, M-O-R-L-E-S, uh, Safeway Private Insurance from Arizona, sent me a letter or sent my attorney a letter uh, 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 honoring the notice of offer of work, suggesting that I should sign it and send it to Arizona, which I did registered mail in 2013. My attorney, uh, Modesto Legal Clinic sent me a letter to report to work immediately. I did so. Safeway and the union did not comply, or the union didn't take any action, and even though that they were aware of, or I made them aware of, that I had a severe profound hearing impairment to their attorney, and I also sent them a copy of a document of an examination showing and stating with a prescription that I had a severe profound hearing impairment, and they ignored it. In fact, I asked for arbitration and the union attorney denied it, but suggested or mentioned the fact that we know you have a disability issue and that uh, arbitration is refused and that you could pursue it under workman's comp if you wish to do so. At that point, I figured I exhausted the union uh, uh, system, whatever it is, uh, I exhausted it, and now it's in uh, workman's comp lap. So uh, at that point, uh, they didn't comply. They put it on workman's comp comply, so I'm asking workman's comp to enforce the notice of offer of work, and I'm asking for trial, uh, because I'm assuming the fact that they're in violation of 2009 Discrimination Act against the uh, severe profound hearing impairment or people with hearing impairment and that the union did not comply with federal law. So I could be wrong or I could be right, I don't know. So, but I'm asking to go to trial so that the, uh, the judge can uh, uh, make a decision on that for the fact that I've been sitting at home waiting for a phone call or, or registered mail to report to work since December 7, 2010, and I need a court order to get all back, pay and benefits seven days a week, 14 hours a day, uh, plus my lifetime medical to be restored, um, a medical, prescription drug, uh, Delta Dental, eyeglasses, and I don't know about hearing impairment, and then I'm at 90%, so I don't, I, I don't know uh, what the court wants to do about that, but I, I'm asking for it to be reinstated. And uh, uh, the fact is... Uh, I'd like to make a notation for um, uh, for trial. Add this uh, notation to the note, uh, to the recording I just made. And today is uh, Monday, April 27, 20, 22nd, 2013. Uh, just add this recording to the notation I just made for the fact that uh, I should never lose my lifetime medical that I paid for for the last 10 years. And, uh, and the fact that uh, I should have for some protection from the court, that whether they retaliate on me or they send me home or quit or fired, whatever, uh, I should have some protection from the court that I don't lose my lifetime medical for life with no premium. I don't pay any premium when I retire. So that should be protected no matter what happens in the future that uh, I don't lose my lifetime medical that I'm covered. 
on your health and welfare for life. Whether I'm working or not, uh, I, I, it shouldn't be uh, stopped no matter what, okay? Because I have a disability and I have a hearing impairment. And, uh, and I pay for that. That's a lifetime medical plan. I should have some protection from the court. Uh, so uh, I hope the court can decide on that lifetime medical plan that they're not allowed to take that away from me no matter what, whether I'm fired or sent home or I quit or no matter what, my lifetime medical plan is to continue on without a break in service. So I'm asking for that. Uh, if the uh, court could make a decision on that, I would appreciate it. Due to the fact it's a union shop and that uh, uh, they discriminate against me, uh, the union. Um, so I, I, I don't know uh, why they didn't accommodate me or anything else. It took, I, I lost my lifetime medical. Um, uh, it's, it's wrong. I, I'm asking for some protection and no breaking coverage if I should be sent home or they retaliate or I quit, whatever. No break in lifetime medical plan. That it should be uh, continued on for life because I have a permanent disability. Uh, that's my notation to be added to the last recording. And uh, I should know that I, Julia Zamora, invoke double standards. Life is not fair. Due to the fact that uh, all disciplinary action was denied on December 17, 2010, because the grievance was received by Team to Local 439, Mr. Nightwalker, on December 17, it was stamped, stamped received Local 439 on December 17, 2010. That's more than 10 days. And I should note they didn't respond in 10 days on December 25th, 2010, when they were required to do so according to contractual procedures, and they violated the time limits and also step one and step two of the contract. And I should also like to note for the record that the fact that any documents or any evidence or statements that's not received by December 26, 2010, not to be valid and not to be accepted by the court, due to the fact that they didn't follow contractual procedure or time limits. Due to the fact that they didn't follow contractual procedure or time limits. They didn't produce anything by December 26, 2010. And all issues are dropped, null and void, final and binding. There are no issues after December 26, 2010. Uh, and which they didn't comply and the uh, union didn't enforce contractual procedures let alone a hearing device or assisted hearing device at the panel hearing and he put it in a bit and sent me home. So I'm asking to go to trial uh, for the court to, to, uh, to get a court order for back pay and benefits and automatic retirement on my birthday on September 7, 2013. And that everything to be restored back pay and benefits and pension and RSVP. I don't make any any payments at the premium uh, lifetime medical. I need that reinstated and I don't make no premium payments after I retire, none. And I need that reinstated or, re or made whole again, including my pension, my back pay and health and welfare to be paid. Because my wife is sick and she ended up in the hospital and, uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's really hard. I have to pay for that bill. So if they could pay for the health and welfare for the year of 2013, that would I would appreciate it, and then I, I wouldn't have to make payments to the hospital. Um, so uh, and the union uh, put it on uh, workman's comp to resolve these issues. They said I could pursue it under workman's comp, so that's why I'm bringing all that up in the union matter. I'm bringing it up for the fact that they didn't deal with the issues of severe profound hearing impairment and the fact that it didn't deal with the issue, the fact that the dispatcher on December 6, 2010 uh, changed the time on my logs from 10.30 uh, to 11.15, uh, taking the time from the second time clock. Uh, I should note that it put me in violation of the Department of Transportation and Company policy. And he accused me on December 7, 2010, of falsifying documents or intent to falsify documents uh, that he authored or falsified on December 6, 2010. 
And I should also note that the onboard automatic recording device in the tractor uh, is tamper proof. Tamper proof. And you also have to have a key in order to change anything. And the dispatch is the only one with the key. Uh, I'm assuming that's correct because uh, I've seen them change the time on logs before. And I'd like to note also that uh, we get paid by the trip sheet. The trip sheet that belongs to the tractor that prints out logs. I should note that uh, they don't pay delay, they just pay trip miles. Sometimes they pay delay, sometimes they don't. So my point being is the fact that uh, when we log out of that truck, we're off duty. Now, if we, uh, if we log out of that truck, we're off duty and we're required to uh, clock out in the driver's room and clock in. Why? I don't know when we're already on duty. The fact is, it's not being recorded and we're not getting paid by that second time clock. I haven't been paid in the last 10 years myself or 400 other truck drivers. I should know that the time clock uh, in the driver's room were required to clock out. When we log out of that truck, we're still on duty according to company policy or, uh, or are instructed to do so, myself and 400 other truck drivers. When we're logged out of that tractor, we're not allowed to go home. We have to clock out of the, and check in in the driver's room and clock out, and there's no time card. We don't get paid by the hour when we should be getting paid by the hour for services rendered, but we're not. And uh, I was sent home on December 7, 2010, and I didn't get paid for that day, and there's no time card. Uh, in fact, there's not even a trip sheet for that day. What happened to it, where it went, I don't know. But uh, in any event, uh, I should get all back paid. Uh, there's no doubt about it, okay? And the dispatcher is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt because he altered my logs by taking the time off the second time clock and changing the time on my logs, which he's not required to do so or has the authority to do so according to the Department of Transportation Regulation. 395.15, 395.16, and 395.8. Uh, he's not uh, allowed to alter or change anything on non logs. And if he is, he's supposed to make the driver aware uh, that he did so. And he didn't make me aware on December 7, 2010, what he did on December 6, 2010. And again, I was not fired on December 6, 2010, or December 7, 2010, for the record, or corrected them, whatever the case is. I don't know what authority they have on changing laws. Uh, I, under the Department of Transportation 395.15, 395.16, and the interpretation in 395.8, uh, it states in there that they're not allowed to alter or change anything on them laws. If there's a problem, there's a right in the remark section what the problem is. And what the problem is, and make the driver aware. They didn't do so on December 7, 2010. And uh, so I should note for the record that uh, they didn't honor the notice of offer work at least three times. They denied to put me back to work. And that I have a permanent disability according to the QME report. And then I and it states in there that I can do my uh, customary duties on my job. And I should also note that uh, according to the legal document that I have that was requested by Judge Grill in the settlement conference to a two attorneys that I just received, that I have a severe profound, a severe profound hearing impairment since 2006, and that uh, I did read. Uh, I'm not good at it yet, but I'm learning, and I'm also uh, I'm trying to learn sign language. But I, the point is, I've never been accommodated uh, at any time since 2006, and they need to accommodate me with hearing aids. But I bought my own, and they're old, and, it, and they don't work at all. And uh, I need something that, uh, that uh, doesn't, uh, that blocks out background noise and, and stuff like that from the Reaper. So again, I'm asking for a court order to be returned to work, all back pay and benefits and, and uh, health and welfare and my lifetime medical uh, uh, according to the 2009 Disability Act and also to the contract, okay? Because I didn't do nothing wrong in December 7, 2010. 
The only thing I, I received was a notice of offer of work, and they just flat out sent me home, and I was also on FMLA. So this is my request for, for trial, uh, for Judge Bill to consider sending this case to trial to resolve the issues of the Disability Act of 2009, hearing impairment. Uh, uh, I, I would appreciate it if we did that, and I also would appreciate the fact that uh, he enforced the uh, notice of offer of work and return me to work according to the contract. And, uh, and I would appreciate that. And I should point out that um, the fact is that uh, they've been refusing me, denying me medical treatment. I don't get paid every week or every two weeks since 321 2009 or 417 2009. They refuse me to put me back to work when I have a full duty release to go to work. Um, they won't accommodate me with hearing aids. Um, they won't honor the notice of offer work. I hate to keep repeating myself, but I do have a severe profound hearing impairment. And, uh, and my life is on the line. And I need the notice of offer and work uh, to be enforced for the fact that my daughter needs one more year at the university to get her BA in biology. One more year. I need that one more year. And they made an agreement where workmen stopped to work me that one year. And I'm asking for it to be enforced so that my daughter can diversity. And uh, that was a guarantee for one year. And I didn't start one day on the 10 o'clock shift Eureka run. So I'm asking Judge Bill to consider that. And I'm also asking him to consider the fact that a double standard is the application of different sets of principles for familiar situations or two different people in the same situation. A double standard may take the form of an instance in which certain concepts often, for example, a word, phrase, social norm, or rule are perceived as acceptable to be applied by one group of people but are considered unacceptable, taboo, when applied by another group. The concept of double standard has long been applied as early as 1872, to different moral structures on men versus women. A double standard thus can be described as a sort of bias, morally unfair suspension towards a certain group of the principle that all are equal in their freedoms. Such double standards are seen as unjustified because they violate a basic maxim of modern legal jurisprudence that all parties should stand equal before the law. Double standards also violate the principle of justice, known as impartiality, which is based on the assumption that the same standard should be applied to all people without regard to subjective bias or favoritism based on social class, rank, ethnicity, gender, religion, sexual orientation, age, or other distinctions. A double standard violates this principle by holding different people accountable according to different standards. The phrase, life is not fair, may be invoked in order, in order to mollify concerns of all double standards. <clears throat> I'm hoping that Judge Bill considers this statement for the fact that uh, if uh, the company doesn't <clears throat> comply with the time limits under the contract, 1,500 teamsters are returned to work immediately. Well, that, uh, they, they didn't put me back to work. And James Williams, the tra transportation manager, he knows everything. He knows what's going on. But he didn't comply. He didn't put me to work back to work like they do for 1,500 teamsters or 400 truck drivers. I should note that for the record. And I should also note for the record that they didn't accommodate me with any listening device whatsoever since 2006. So uh, uh, I'm asking uh, Judge Bill to consider this and to enforce a notice of offer of work because my life is on the line here and I have no lifetime medical, I have no medical coverage whatsoever. Even though I paid for it in 2002, I paid uh, $3,000 plus uh, to cover for five years so that I can retire at any time. And I should also note that the fact that Safeway called 
to help some law firms that I didn't work at Safeway. And uh, that barred me from getting any kind of lifetime medical or, or asking them to uh, keep me covered. That didn't happen. So, uh, and the fact that the, uh, that the uh, dispatcher who falsified my log by taking the time off the second time clock and, uh, and they have a no fault attendance policy and they applied it to everybody else, but they didn't apply it to me. No fault attendance policy that's been uh, uh, as part of the uh, company policy for 10 years that I've been there. And uh, from my understanding, it's been on there for at least 20 years. No fault attendance policy. So, uh, and the fact that I never received any registered mail or anything else stating that I didn't work at Safeway any time, at any time, not within the time limits, okay? So, uh, and the fact uh, that they just flat out sent me home and they didn't pay me on December 7, 2010. They took my time card or my trip sheet or whatever it is and disposed of it. I don't know where or when it disappeared. And I never got paid for that day. So that's why I'm asking for back pay from December 7, 2010. And I hope Judge Bill considers again to enforce a notice of offer of work and then to send this case to trial. Uh, and I will hope he considers this seriously for the fact that I have a hearing impairment and uh, that the union should be held responsible under the Disability Act of 2009. And that's my statement for the court. Uh, so this is, uh, so I hope Judge Bill considers the, the double standards. I'd actually like to note uh, one thing that I stand to be corrected by uh, my statements and everything uh, due to the fact that, uh, that I have a notice of offer of work that I received on December 1st, 2010. Mike Sadler and James Williams uh, are well aware of the fact that I have a notice of offer of work that I'm guaranteed for one year, and they and they refuse to comply. Um, and I'm sitting here waiting for a phone call or registered mail to report to work, and they refuse to do so. And I should also like to note for the record that any statements or documents that's not handed in before December 26, 2010, should not be accepted by the court. Uh, because uh, anything not uh, uh, sent in by December 26, 2010, okay, is null and void, final and binding, and all issues are dropped. And James Williams and Mike Sadler of the Safety Department and James Williams of the, uh, the Transportation Department, the manager, uh, knows all this. But it doesn't matter. They refuse to put me to work. They refuse to comply with contractual procedure or work when it's comp rules and regulations. Now, again, I repeat myself, I stand to be corrected, but I'm asking the judge not to accept any documents that's not dated before December 26, 2010. And, uh, and I hope he considers uh, double standards. I, Julio Zamora, invoke double standards. Life is not fair.